This is Join Us in France, episode 86. Hello, I'm Annie, and today I'm talking to Janice, who is a retired elementary school principal from Canada, who has a passion for France, and who goes out of her way to find unique experiences in France. On her website, francetraveltips.com, she says she can't stop going to France. And yes, she's been here a surprising number of times. I guess she's almost an honorary local by now or something like that. On the show, we talk about some of the things that she has tried and why she enjoyed them so much. Because these are things that you can do too, even if you never get to live in France. My recording software cut off some of our hellos at the beginning. It's a little awkward, but it's understandable anyway. So here's Janice from francetraveltips.com. Good morning. Good morning, Janice. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Wonderful. Thank you. Very nice to talk to you. Oh, it's great talking to you. I tell you, I listen to your podcast so often, I feel like I know you. <laughs> well, that's what my happens. Compliment, with my compliments. Um, well, thank you. I'm, I'm really wowed by your podca podcast because of just the, the background information that you provide. All right. Well, why don't we start by you telling us just a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm a retired elementary school principal, Ooh. and I retired a few years ago. And uh, since then, I've, uh, you know, you're, when one is in retirement, one looks for hobbies and things like that. Uh -huh. So I uh, took up coding to Ooh. learn how to create a website and very challenging, but really interesting. And then I got into, well, that was the, the purpose was to create a website. And From the scratch. website I created uh, is called France Travel Tips. Um, so I was able to create it from scratch, but then thought, no, I'm going to go with something a little more pre-made. <laughs> so since then, um, I've been writing, doing weekly posts of my memories of my trips to France, and then I keep going back to France. Right. You've been, what did you tell me, 25 times? No, 24. <laughs> oh, 24. Sorry, I'm jumping the gun here. <laughs> I may stop actually using the number after 25 because it sounds ridiculous. But um, <laughs> And it's interesting. I get two, obviously, two different reactions. One is, like, why don't you go somewhere else? Yeah, well. And then I get other people who say, gosh, if you love it, why don't you live there? And uh, a group of really supportive friends who say, oh, who cares what people say? If you like it, why not? That's right. And, you know, I'm not alone. I know there are a lot of people around the world who just love France. So the reason why I wanted to talk to you is, well, first of all, you, your website is really interesting. You do have a lot of interesting information on France on your website. And what I, I like is that you it seems like you're always looking for kind of unique things about France. Absolutely. Like no. every t every time I go back. I, I want to try something new, experience something new. <laughs> so give us some, some of your, some examples of new things that you have found. Well, a couple, I'm a runner and in the past, and I guess it's only been the past 15 years, I've done six races in France. Wow. And one thing I should point out to your listeners who may be thinking about a race in France, you have to get a doctor's certificate. You, do you have to have a doctor sign off that you're healthy enough to do the race. Correct. Yep. Regard, regardless of, you know, it could be a five kilometer race or a marathon. That's right. Even if you want to sign up for, a, you know, playing pétanque, uh, yes. the, the little bull thing, well, yeah. you have to join a club. And to join any club in France, you have to have a doctor's certificate. I didn't realize that. Oh, my gosh. Anybody, like pétanque. Well, of course, if it's a sewing club, it's not the same. <laughs> but but any, any, any club that has anything even remotely sports-like, you know, a right. walking group, uh, <laughs> anything wow. like that, you have to have your doctor's certificate. And also, the doctor is likely going to make you do jumping jacks or things like <laughs> that. So So he can measure... How fast your how fast your heart rate goes and how quickly it goes down to normal. Oh my gosh! <laughs> well, maybe maybe it's a good thing. Certainly, when you're doing a marathon, sure. and you know, I did two marathons in uh, France. One was the Marathon du Médoc, 
which I highly recommend even to non-runners. I believe you are allowed to still do the race if you walk it, but you have to walk it under six and a half hours. I may have my facts wrong, but um, okay, well, six and a half hours, that would be a pretty fast walk, but still. Possibly, yeah. 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 People, go, people go into this race. It's, it's in uh, Poyac, which is uh, about two hours away from Bordeaux. Right. And people go into this race not to get their best time. And I certainly, my intention not was, was not to get the best time. My intention was to not cross the finish line drunk. Uh, because oh really? At, yeah, I know. Woman, you are. <laughs> this race is phenomenal. It's a party and a carnival. People <laughs> are dressed in costumes. Uh, the year I did it, which was uh, 2013, I think, it was the science fiction theme. Oh wow! So there were people. You, hopefully, you put the picture in the website um, on your website. Yeah. Near the end of the race. There were these guys dressed as Flash Gordon and uh, <laughs> comic book hero. There were about eight or nine of these guys. And I really liked how they were dressed and they were all running together. So That's as fantastic. we approached the oyster station, and yes, there was oysters, oh, wow. roast beef, you name it. <laughs> I asked, could I have a picture taken with them? And not only did they say yes, but they picked me up. Like... <laughs> They all lifted me up, so I have a fabulous picture of me with them. <laughs> That's great. Well, you know, probably the people who are dressed up, they're doing it to raise money for sure. something specific. And so it's a group effort. Yeah. I mean, that's right. Actually, you bring back a memory. There were these guys pushing a guy in a boat. So all <laughs> these runners were surrounding this boat. There was also a guy in flippers and a tutu. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how he did 42 kilometers in yeah. flippers, but he did. He did. Anyways, yeah. what's great about this uh, race is that there are 23 water stations, and at every water station, there's a, Bo a Bordeaux wine. And I'm talking really, really good wines. <laughs> um, you don't get drunk. I mean, you no. take a sip, you drink some water. I mean, my plan was have a little wine, have a little water eat something, you know, they had chips, granola bars, yeah. uh, that kind of thing. They're What's regular. interesting is in France at their races, in Canada and North America, uh, they have power drinks, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But in French races, they have oranges and sugar cubes. And it, yeah. the sugar cubes just throw me. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing, but anyways. But French different. people are used to it. And I think the Toulouse Marathon is a little bit in that same vein. I don't know that they give you uh, Bordeaux wine to taste <laughs> <laughs> or any other wine for that matter. Yeah. But but the, I do know a lot of people who run it and who just do it in costume or wearing funny hats or something because they do it to raise money for sure. some sort of group or other. So, yeah. yeah, so th that's that's really fun. And you said you also did the Paris Marathon. Right. And, you know, what a wonderful way to see the sights of Paris. Indeed. Um, you know, one of the hardest parts was running in the, I can't remember, uh, 14th arrondissement. I can't remember what area it was. And I could smell someone roasting chicken. And, huh? you know, you're running, this was a marathon, 42 kilometers, and you, you get hungry. And you you have you know, a number of hours to daydream. And when you start smelling roasted chicken, and as we know, the French are fabulous chefs. Yeah. It was really hard. <laughs> this race, too, um, is one of the biggest. There were 40,000 racers, wow. uh, runners, and we start at the Arc de Triomphe. And what's interesting is I was in the porta potty when the gun went off, <laughs> but that was fine because it takes... 15, 20 minutes to get to the start line. Of course. So I had no fear of, you know, oh gosh, they're going to close the race and I won't be able to start. Right. Yeah, um, they, you, they just, yeah, you have plenty of time yeah. to get started. So would you say the one in Paris is more competitive than oh, the one you did uh, in uh, absolutely. the Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's a great race, uh, you know, and there's stops along the way to get water, oranges, sugar cubes. Yeah. Uh, but at the end... 
I guess maybe I was delirious. I could only get, you know, an energy drink and I was looking for the food. Yeah. Uh, once again, in, in France, they don't serve bagels. I mean, I've done another race where they handed out pound cake, chocolates, prunes. Yeah. I couldn't find anything. And uh, so I decided to hop on the subway, the metro. And I must have looked awful because this woman said, you know, in French, do you, do you want my seat? Oh. <laughs> I, of course, took it because I was exhausted. Of course. But then, you know, I was arriving back in the area where I had rented an apartment with uh, one of my friends. And so my friend Judy said, you need some food. So we went to a cafe and I got a jambon beurre, which is a ham sandwich. And yep. you, you don't feel like eating after running a lot. But what's funny is that you have to. Yeah, you have to. After the race and after showering, we hopped on the subway again and went to a show. So wow. I still have some energy left in me. Wow, you are strong. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Congratulations. That's wonderful. Thank you. That's wonderful. The other thing you mentioned when we when I talked to you previously for the pre interview is that you, you have a thing for uh de chevaux. I want to ride in a uh, Citroen C V two. <laughs> now I don't when you look at the logo on my um website, I fell in love with that car. And actually when I was in France last time, they were doing a uh, CV2 rally from uh -huh. Paris to Provence. And so I tweeted them, and I wanted to know when they would be passing. I think they actually shared their itinerary, and they were going to be in Gord um, on a certain date. So I actually stood by the road in the afternoon, <laughs> and one came by, and I got a great picture of it. <laughs> so I'm always looking out for really unique photos. Yeah. The oh. Citroën cars? Yes. I, and that's only been recent. You know, I guess uh, when I was at last in France, which was in April and May, mm -hmm. uh, I had seen these cars, the Du Chevaux, which is by Citroën. It's a very classic car. I think it was made in 1948. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're the greatest cars, but they really, to me, represent France. <laughs> and so I started searching for these cars uh, to take pictures. And I ultimately used it as one of the symbols in my uh, website yes. uh, logo. And I just think they're really, I bought two little toy cars and gave one to my godson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I have one sitting at home as well. Yeah, little. somehow, somehow Citroën, Citroën, I guess you say yeah. in English, they've managed to put out cars that have become kind of iconic. Mm -hmm. the, the Deux Chevaux is one and the DS, the DS... Yes. It's like this elongated, um, sleek looking. Oh, oh, like a sports car. Oh, yes. Kind of like a sports car. It was very advanced uh, in the 70s when it was, because it, like, it had this suspension. You got in, and when you turned on the engine, it would raise off the, <laughs> the you know, it was like a. I don't know. The suspension had to pump up before you could get moving. It was oh, just wow. the weirdest. And it felt like a boat when you rode in one of those. It, wow. it, it, my mother didn't want one. My father wanted one. And my <laughs> mother didn't because she said that it, ça lui faisait mal au, donnait mal au coeur. So, that, so it was, um, making her want to throw up. <laughs> oh, gee. That it, because it was so, it was too soft. It was too soft to ride. Now you <laughs> wouldn't have that problem with a deux chevaux. That is not a soft ride. <laughs> so. Oh, well, you know, you were nice enough to send me a picture of the inside of one, and I'm going, whoa, that looks really um, yeah. <laughs> not soft padding anywhere. <laughs> no, it's a really basic, basic car. And mm -hmm. there are people who uh, race them. I don't know if race is really the word for it, but ride them all over around the world because it's one of those cars where you can do everything with – you can make parts with – basic tools you can you wow. know, replace anything it's basic enough that it's really um it's a tinkerer's car all right so some other great uh, and unique experiences you've had in france is some some things that have to do with cooking because you like cooking yes as well. well i uh went to a fabulous school you know you search the internet and you try to find you know language schools so it first started by uh i went to this language school uh, west of Lyon, and it's actually out, uh, near Rouen. It's the little town is Riorge, and the school is called École des Trois Ponts. 
Okay. And I went to the language school in 2010 for a week. So you had about three hours of lessons in the morning. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful. It was full immersion because it's, you're with other students and the teachers for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Wow. And I don't want to say it's a rule, but you're encouraged only to speak French at all times. Sure. So you really progress. And it's a great way to, you know, really improve quickly. Sure. The following spring, I went back, and in, in addition to doing the uh, French lessons in the morning, I did cooking in the afternoon. And what's nice is the classes were small. Uh, in this particular class, there were only three other students, the teacher and me. Mm. And yeah. we also cooked together. And wow. uh, it was, you know, lots of laughing. I mean, it's not just drill and, and rote learning. It's engaging in games and uh, yeah. to the point where we were actually joking with one another in French. That's and, great. You know, you make friends. I mean, I still keep in contact with this couple who uh, were from Dublin and they live in Switzerland and the teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, but the cooking classes were a riot because it was done in French. So that was difficult to begin with. Because that's a totally different vocabulary. Of course. Yeah, it's very specific. And you're also drinking wine <laughs> while you cook. Um, and you'd be making the, uh, you know, the entree, which is the appetizer in English, uh, the plat, the main course, and the dessert, um, ranging from, you know, tart tatin, rack of lamb, mm -hmm. uh, creme brulee, beef with three sauces. Uh, oh, I think you ate pretty well, too. <laughs> oh, it, yeah, and, you know, I think I did this course after the Paris Marathon. Thank God, because you burn so many calories. Yeah. And, you know, so for the next week I was eating like a pig. Yeah. Uh, but it was wonderful. I mean, the food was spectacular. And the our teacher, the chef, had actually trained at, oh, I can't remember the name. It's a famous Michelin star restaurant mm. in uh, Rouen. Mm. Trois, Trois Gros. Oh, that's uh, possible. I don't yes. know Rouen very, at all, actually. So, but, uh, so he was fabulous and we learned so much. That's great. That's great. Well, I think that's a very interesting concept. First of all, I would say to learn a language. And I have been in a university setting in the U.S. where that was the rule was all you had, you had to speak the language 24 seven mm -hmm. when in this house. And it is amazing how fast you progress. I mean, you yeah. just, you just need to improve because you have to come up with words for all sorts of things. You have to talk it's, about all yeah. sorts of things. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a very, it's a very good, very cool concept. I, I think if any of our listeners are looking for a for a language school, that might be that might be a good one. More yes. interesting than your average, you know, sit down, let's do some drills kind of things. Oh, absolutely! It, you know, that, the best way to learn is through fun interaction, not yeah. just you know sheets of paper. Yeah. Uh, and I would definitely go back there because I improved so much. Right. And see, yes. this is this is the school principal telling us, so we should. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, at first. It is nerve wracking. Uh, I have a very good friend from my university days who's decided to take up French and, you know, she was emailing me how difficult it is. And it is. I mean, yeah. uh, you're nervous. You, you make mistakes. But yeah. I, one of the things I love about the French, and I don't take this a bad way, they will correct you if you say something incorrectly. Yep, they <laughs> will. And that's fine, you know, I have no problem with that. Yeah, yeah, they, they will. And it's one of the things that surprised me when I moved to England is that the Brit British were not correcting my English. They were all, oh. you know, acquiescing. And I could hear myself. I knew I said it wrong, <laughs> but they wouldn't fix it for me. And French yeah. people, oh, yeah, they'll fix it for you. Especially if you <laughs> yeah. say at any point, oh, yeah, correct me if, uh, if I'm wrong. And they do it so naturally, like just as if they're speaking, a, just replying to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's how we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we it's kind of a cultural thing. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So so some food is a, is a theme for you because you also went to make macaroons at the Cordon Bleu. Right. They're macarons. 
Yeah. Um, you know, for your listeners, they're sweet meringue-based cookies. Right. Not, the, ma- not the coconut macaroons. Now, which I can't stand. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, I like them both. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's nice, I actually made these with my nieces uh, here back in Toronto because they're there are very few ingredients. It's basically ground almonds, egg whites, icing sugar, and then the ganache, the, the filling inside. Mm-hmm. And this course was fabulous. It's not cheap. At, when I did it a few years ago, it was about 90 euros, and I, I believe it's gone up in price. Mm. It's about three hours, and there is a French chef, mm. and he only speaks French. But that's mm. okay because, thank God, there was an English translator. And how they do it is uh, he demonstrates, Mm -hmm. and then you have also all the utensils in front of you, all the ingredients laid out and already measured. Mm -hmm. And so after he demonstrates, you attempt it. Mm -hmm. And he comes around and corrects you, helps you. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's wonderful. And there are only about 12 people in the class. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah. So have you been been making uh, macaron ever since? Uh, yeah, the problem is I will also eat them. So, <laughs> uh, you know, when I was at uh, Cordon Bleu, we ended up making about 40 of them each, which was spectacular. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's like basically all sugar. And, mm, you yeah. know, when I went back to the apartment, of my friend Judy was staying with me. We kind of munched on them, but I mean, how many macarons can you eat? So back in Toronto, if I'm going to make macarons, it's for a party. It's with my nieces so I can share them, but I would never make them just for myself to yeah. have here in my home. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, they would um, disappear probably faster than you'd like. Well, and the other thing is you can't make them in humid weather because right. they won't rise properly. And... Uh, they, I don't think they last that long. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. They have to be eaten, you know, fairly quickly. Yes. But, you know, it's they're not easy to make because whisking them by hand, you use a muscle that you don't usually yes. use. Uh, but they're worth it. I mean, they sell for, what, two to three euros. No, okay, one and a half to two and a half euros yeah. per macaron. And that's very expensive. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's an expensive treat mm-hmm. for most people. But yeah. again, if you're like if you're um, allergic to gluten, they're gluten free unless you put some in the filling. Yeah. But you know, so they they have good, they, yeah, and and they're tasty. I mean, you know, you made a comment before. I must really love food or whatever. Well, what's funny is, I I got a um a reply on one of my posts from uh, one of my best friends. And she said, I have to confront you on this comment that you're making. You say that you don't love food, but all your posts are about food. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I guess so. And I I realize, yeah, when I'm in France, I love the food. I love pastries. I, you know, yeah. 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 And you have, you also have something for Angelina hot chocolate. Oh, okay. So Angelina's is a uh, cafe, tea room. Uh, They actually have, I think, like 50 or 60 outlets around the world. But in Paris, one of the main tea rooms is on the Rue de Rivoli, which is across from the Louvre. And they're often lineups. And you can take out from this place. And the first time I took out, but the second time I brought my niece, who was in Paris on kind of a belated honeymoon trip. Mm-hmm. And we had uh, African hot chocolate. Mm. And it is, it's made, I guess, with three different types of African uh, cocoa. And it's thick, like syrup. Yeah, It is so tasty. I mean, I, I was groaning. I w- it was so delicious. Oh, <laughs> and they bring you a bowl of whipped cream. To top it off. <laughs> so when I went the first time with my friend Lori, it was like, uh, this is to die for. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, they're also known, and I didn't have it, but it's also known for uh, this dessert called the Mont Blanc, which is yeah. meringue again, whipped cream, and I think chestnut paste, but I didn't order that. It's just too much sugar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, but it's you know, definitely a place to go to. 
your attitude about life in general is very French because <laughs> French people will eat and eat and eat and eat, but then they go run in a marathon or, <laughs> or they go playing soccer or they do a lot of physical activity or they don't mind walking everywhere we go because we're very lucky. The weather in oh. most of France is fairly mild. Mm -hmm. And so it's nobody looks at you funny if you're walking to the store or, or to the bus or to whatever you want to do. Like, it's yeah. totally normal. And, you, you know, walk. Mireille uh, Guglielmo's uh, book, I, I apologize if I said her name wrong, you know, French women don't get fat. It's, yeah. it's all the walking. It's not using elevators. Yeah. Um, it's funny that you mentioned I must be French. I have to share with you, I was born on Bastille Day. Uh -huh. <laughs> which is French national holiday. And I know my friends think, you must have been French in your past life. And I that's went, yeah, I guess I right. was. That's right. That's <laughs> right. You're reincarnated. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> but you also like music. It's not just food. You also like music. So share with us um, the kind of musical experiences you've had in yeah. Paris. Because um, I think a lot of people might be interested in that. Yes. Well, there's a uh, famous... Uh, chapel or, or uh, church called Saint Chapelle, yes. and it's right near Notre Dame, and uh, it is known for its stained glass because, and it's mm -hmm. quite stunning. Yes. But my friend Lori, I think this was one of our first trips. Uh, I convinced her to come to France with me, and her <laughs> husband said, "Oh, just take her, you know, get it out of her system." <laughs> but of course it's not out of her system. So we went, she suggested, I guess we saw a flyer. There are tons of flyers posted on walls in Paris. Mm -hmm. And Saint-Chapelle was having a classical music concert. Yes. And it's in a me medieval, you know, Gothic church. So we were able to kill two birds with one stone by not only seeing the stained glass, but hearing, uh, you know, Vivaldi's Four Seasons or, you know, uh, other classical music. Right. It's, uh, and typically it's, I mean, your example of the Four Seasons is, is very apropos because is, this is what I call classical music light, you know, like or the hits of yes. classical music that everybody's heard of. Yeah. So you're not going to hear anything edgy. No. Because typically what it is is these are very accomplished performers mm -hmm. who probably – uh, play with the opera or play with the symphony in Paris and they get together in a small quartet or a small group and they put on something that's very pleasing yes. and they pass around flyers and they fill the Saint-Chapelle and they make a little extra money for, you know, the musicians and composers are always looking for a little extra money, I suppose. Right. And so, and, and it's very, very popular. These are not heavy concerts that will take hours and, and it's not like going to a Wagner opera or something. Mm -hmm. You're just there for an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Exactly. And it's very pleasant and it's very beautiful. And it's, it's, it, I, I love this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But if you are uh, very, very much into classical music, you, know, you, you might find the program a little bit underwhelming because it's yes. not going to be anything too challenging. Right. I mean, I decided in my last trip, I wanted to go to another classical music concert. Uh -huh. So I thought, okay, I'm not going to go to Saint-Chapelle. I've been there. So I was looking for a different place. So I went yeah. to Église uh, Saint-Germain-de-Pré, mm -hmm. which is just on the south side of uh, Boulevard Saint-Germain. Yeah. Again, it's another Gothic church. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, a lot of those in Paris. <laughs> yeah. And now, it's supposedly, it's the oldest church in Paris, but I don't know if that's true. <laughs> um, and they had Vivaldi's Four Seasons again. You were right. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the tickets are not uh, expensive. It was like 29 euros, and it's a great little evening outing. Exactly, exactly. And it's something that you're going to enjoy. Yes. You know, you can't overthink these things. If what you enjoy is Vivaldi's Four Seasons, then by all means, you know, go yeah. hear that because it's fun. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. fun, you know, so... Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think I find that Paris and any other town in France, if you want to go to some concerts and you want maybe the stuff that doesn't get advertised on flyers, etc., what you do is you go to the FNAC. This is yes. a store in France, the mm -hmm. FNAC, and they sell tickets to all sorts of things. Exactly. 
ask for what well, you know what's coming up in the next few days and they <laughs> they can sell you a ticket right there um the other way you can do that but this is probably they won't have a lot of classical stuff is if you go to any grocery store like Auchan, Carrefour, mm -hmm. the big ones anyway, they have a booth typically where you can buy, it's also a ticket office. So that would be another way for visitors to find out what's playing and, you know, go attend something. All right. Well, you know, um, I've gone to a number of concerts, actually a couple of, one of them was free. That was in, um, the Alsace, I was in uh, Nancy, and uh -huh. Patricia Cass, who's my favorite French uh, <laughs> singer, yes. was giving a concert. And uh, I also went to the Olympia in Paris. Wow. I ordered tickets in advance because she was playing um, Cass Chant Piaf. So she was singing uh, Edith Piaf songs. So that was you know, that. another unique experience, going to yeah. the Olympia, which is a renowned uh, concert hall. Yes, yeah, the uh, yeah, Olympia is is a uh, yeah, it's a everybody's heard of it in France because that's where kind of more popular French singers uh, go put on shows. It's a good size room, but it's not too huge. It's mm -hmm. it's very nice. It's very yeah. nice. Yeah. That's cool. So, is there are there any areas of France that you have <laughs> not visited? <laughs> That's funny. You know, I'm constantly looking at the map going, uh, you know, where should I go next? I mean, yeah. I keep going back to Paris because I love it. Yeah. Um, I haven't, I've done Normandy, but not the upper east part, Lille, Calais. Um, I will do that one day. Uh, yeah. And seeing, uh, let me think, Brittany, the far yes. west. Although my friend Laurie and I are planning a trip to the Guernsey uh, Channel Islands. Okay. So we'll visit Saint Malo. Um, yes, yeah, Saint Malo is lovely, but Guernsey yeah. is not French. No, I know, I know. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, it's just a, a boat ride over. So we're gonna yeah. probably do Brittany, and I'd like to do more of the um, the Alps. Sorry, not the Alps. The near um, Biritz. Uh, ah. I was in Biritz uh, after Bordeaux, and I went down to Saint Sebastian and uh, Saint Jean du Luc, and yeah. I tried to go through the Pyrenees, and it was very cloudy. Oh. So I'd like to do that again. And yeah. uh, I'd like, to, obviously, to visit Toulouse again uh, uh -huh. and Albi. I, that was a long time ago. Uh -huh. uh, I love Carcassonne. I, I, I've been to a lot of places, but, yeah, I keep going back to certain places because I love yeah. them. Well, yeah, if you like them, that it's, it's hard not to. I mean... And do you have a favorite? Like, if you have to choose between Paris, Provence, maybe the Strasbourg area or places like yeah. that. What, oh, what? boy. Well, I guess... Give me a quadrant is what, I, <laughs> I guess is what I'm asking you. I like, guess Provence because it was my first trip to France ah. uh, back in 1978. And well, so tell I, us about that. Yeah, so on New Year's Day in 1978... My father announced that the family was going to France. And I had been in love with France even before 1978. Um, hmm. Just very quickly, there was a movie called Two for the Road with Audrey Hepburn and Albert Finney. And they travel from the north of France to the south. And there are ah. flashbacks about their marriage. And I fell in love with France. So I wanted to go there. I think I have seen that movie, but I'm going to have to check it out. See if it's a know. great movie. I mean, it's, it's, I think Travel and Leisure said it was like one of the top 50 film travel films or something like that. That's cool. Anyways, um, so that summer, uh, before I started university, we went to Paris for about a week. And, I've, well, I say this unfortunately because it's funny, but my parents said, no, no, you're not going to take a nap when we arrive. We're putting you on a bus tour. <laughs> and so my older sister and I got on the bus and, you know, it's like, oh my God, we're so tired because of the jet lag. And she fell asleep. And, uh, but we did the tour. And then, uh, we took the French train the, at the time. I don't know if it still exists. It was called the Mistral. Yes. And, no, those, they don't, we don't have the Mistral anymore. Yeah. It, it was a type of service. It was a, I think it, those were regional service trains. Oh, it was fabulous. So we had our own compartment and, we also had a, um, a lunch, so white linen, and 
what was funny is, I guess it was, I don't know, four, five, six course meal with wine. And after the first course, which was fish, I think, my parents thought that was it. They had forgotten that it came with many courses. <laughs> and so they just kept bringing more and more food. Right. Um, and we got to Avignon, rented a car and joined friends of ours who had a house that was built into the town of Gord. So that's how I fell in love with the town of Gord. Ah, uh, yes. So I keep going back there trying to find the house and uh, it's still there. Uh, you know, it's been renovated and it was oh, so unique. Uh, so we spent a week there. Um, my sister and I shared a room and there were baby scorpions on the wall. Ooh. Yeah, thank God. I don't think they killed. Well, who knows? Um, there was nice. a lavender, you know, in the windows, and uh, we drank tons of uh, Chateau Neuf de Pop wine. Well, and, there you go. And did you were a kid food. then? I was nineteen, so I oh, oh. think at the time I could drink. In but, France, you could. <laughs> yeah, but but I don't think I was allowed into a casino. But I did. My dad snuck me in when we went to Monaco. Um, uh -huh. we went f for an overnight trip and, you know, uh, I snuck in. So that was, that was kind of neat. Okay. But, so uh, this is a, this is a side note, but nowadays you couldn't do that anymore because casinos in France have gotten very, very, very much into checking ID. Oh yeah. You have to show your passport. Yep. Because there are, and, and I, I'll just explain that briefly. It's kind of odd, but it's very French. In France, there are laws to protect people who are addicted to uh, gambling. Yes. And so if your spouse uh, is determined to be addicted to gambling, you can put them on a no, no, no gambling list. Oh, and wow. So their ID is now flagged and they <laughs> cannot get into any casino. That's a riot. And if they don't check at the at the entrance, uh, yeah. whoever put the no gambling thing on mm -hmm. can now sue the casino. And so you can bet that they are very motivated to make sure you're not radier de casino. Oh wow! So so it could happen because your spouse, your or your ex spouse. That's what happens mm -hmm. most of the time. Is an ex spouse will say, well, he you know he or she is addicted to gambling. Uh, being irresponsible, we need to, you know, get them what? hard. Yeah. Or people who have cheated, too. People who sure. tried to cheat the casinos. So it's really uh, difficult to enter a casino without, without a, no, you can't. You have to show ID. <laughs> I wanted to go into the casino in Biarritz mm -hmm. just to look at it. But yes. I didn't have my ID with me, and so I didn't. <laughs> and went by the win, right? And this is, this is when I asked, because I was kind of like... Oof. I, you know, you can see I'm not a minor, like, <laughs> uh, and, and, and he was like, no, no, it's, that's not the issue. And, and uh, since there weren't a lot of people that day, he explained the whole thing to me and I, I went back and looked at it and sure enough, that's a thing. You can that's be very interesting. bidden from entering casinos. I think so that's a good have, idea. Yeah. Well, French people, you know, we like to, yeah, yeah. I, I, I know, don't know if the it French are known for bureaucracy. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't know if it would fly in like in the U.S., for instance. Yeah, or, but uh, but yeah. in France, nobody's against it. I've never seen anybody complain. About, like, even people who have a gambling problem, they're like, "Well, yeah, you, you're trying to help me. Thank you." You know. Oh wow, that's great. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so I do love Provence, because, and I was back there in May and stayed two weeks, and you know, I love visiting the small market, the, the small towns, and the markets. Uh, mm -hmm. It just. So what's a typical day like for you when you're in Provence? Let's imagine a typical day. You're here for, you're there for a week. Okay. Uh, so often I would rent a house, a, a, a gîte. A, a gîte is a farmhouse, but it's not farmhouse like what typical. Uh, probably and I would you go, you go through a, a gîte de France or something? Yes. A okay. gîte de France or, um, I think it was home away or something like that. You know? Okay. And, uh, I probably would sit on the terrace having my breakfast. The place that I stayed in back in May was really out in the uh, boondocks. I mean, it, it was in the country. There were uh -huh. roosters walking by. Sure. Uh, but that was fine. Yeah. And then I would probably plan out my day. What I might get up early and go to a market, Il sur le Sorgue, uh, Saint-Rémy, uh, mm -hmm. Gort. Every town 
almost every town has a market oh, yeah. on a particular day. Yeah. And um, yeah, you just need to know what the schedule is. Exactly. Actually, the first house that my friend Laurie and I rented in La Rouvière, which is near Andouze, uh, near Nîmes, th- they were so small that once a week the meat truck would come in and basically sell meat from his truck. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so typical day, I'd, I'd maybe go to a market, uh, get there early because mm-hmm. the parking will be awful, yep. uh, buy my produce or whatever, and then sit at a cafe yep. and have a croissant and a uh, cafe creme. Yeah. And then um, I might do some touring. I love photography, so I might visit a town and, uh, you know, explore. Yeah. Uh, possibly do a picnic mm-hmm. or do a um, go to a restaurant. Yeah. And, of course, have wine. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, what's great is you don't have to buy, like, an expensive wine. You can get a pichet. Yeah. Uh, to, which is a carafe of local wine, which is superb. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's what most French people do. On occasion, if it's a big occasion, they'll buy a bottle of something special but it's for every day you just buy a pichet, a pichet mm-hmm. or exactly. it comes with your meal right the other day i was with uh, my mother-in-law actually and we went to saint antonin nobleval mm-hmm. and i'll talk about it i'll probably do an episode about that uh, fairly soon but what um was a, a little bit uh interesting is that we stopped at a place for lunch and it was very good. It was like 12 euros and 50 cents or something. It was very inexpensive for such a touristy place. The place was really full. By the time we sat down at 1230, I don't think they, I mean, they, they were turning people away because it was very full. Oh. Mm-hmm. And the meal, we just, the, what I like to do is just get the daily special. Yes. So the daily, le menu du jour. Mm-hmm. Unless there's something, I mean, unless I really don't like that. If if they're serving tripe, I'm not having that. I'm sorry, you know. <laughs> I don't care what you say. I don't want it. But if it's anything that I would eat, that I would enjoy, I, I get that because I know it's fresh, it's fast, and it's usually cheaper. Mm-hmm. So that's what I do. So we both ordered the daily special, and it came with wine. My mother-in-law doesn't right. ever drink wine. And so the, I said, well, can she get a soda instead or a glass of orange juice or something? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> oh. And so they bring me a half a, you know, wine for two people. I'm like, well, I'm not going to. that. So I send her back because if you put it in front of me, I might actually drink it because I <laughs> do like it. So I just told her, no, 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 bring me something smaller. So, But they would not uh, make the switch. Oh, and I, look in, I looked into it a little bit, and it's because this kind of house wine that they serve in France is so cheap mm-hmm. that it, it's less money for them than buying a soda, a can of soda or, or, or juice. Mm-hmm. So they just make no substitutions. It's like, uh-huh. no, nope, you yes. got the basement price, no substitutions, which is kind of too bad. I, I think they should do something, even if they charge you, you know, a little bit more. Just Yeah. Like, because there are yeah. some people who come to France who don't drink wine. Well, exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the most memorable meals I ever had uh, was once again near Andouze, and it was called La Truie Trui qui doute. I think the sow or the cow who doubts. Is, anyways, the weird doute. name. La Truie qui doute. Okay. That is a yeah, weird and, name. <laughs> and of course, you say it a hundred times better than I do. We heard about it through people that we had met who owned a chateau in France. Anyways. Very nice. We, we, there were no signs for this restaurant. Uh-huh. To go, you know, through a winding road, winding and dirty roads. But for, I think it was like 165 francs. And at that time it was like $50 per person. Yeah. We got Kier, which is white wine and cassis. Yes. A bottle of red wine, a bottle of white wine, soup. Uh, there was a, Corn beef dish, cassoulet, which I love, which is yeah. white beans and that kind of stuff. Goat cheese and ice cream. I mean, oh. this was a farmhouse that made used local produce, and you basically were served what they were making that day. Mm. 
I mean, yeah. I'll never forget that meal. And that's and that's often the case. And I just I I googled them while you were talking, and I opened their site, and it, they have a they have a website. It looks very nice, but I had to close it because it's playing music, and I couldn't <laughs> turn it off. And I went on the website too <laughs> to search to see if it still existed, and I have to tell you, it didn't look like that. We're talking. Ah. It was a rustic farmhouse. Yes, they had tables. I guess it kind of looked like a restaurant inside, but it was not as nice as it looks there. Fancy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. the prices have all also gone up, I would assume. Sure. But, you know, going for meals where the locals recommend, that is the key. Yeah. Yes. And actually, as a matter of fact, this restaurant where we stopped in saint antonin noble I I asked the lady at the tourist office. I always do this. Uh, always do uh. this. I stop at the tourist office. I ask for a map and I say, for lunch, I would like something not too touristy. Yeah. And uh, within, you know, a certain price range. Mm -hmm. And they always know. They always know exactly what I mean. But of course, I, I'm French. Ah. So I kind of go, yeah, I don't want to hang with the tourists. So where do the locals eat? Mm -hmm. And they, they always tell me. It's, and it's always vastly superior. But I have found also that if you stop... Anywhere in France, you will find most place, places anymore, they have a sandwich shop and a pizzeria. Right. And those are usually not that great. Mm -hmm. But you can eat there for like 10 to 15 euros. Yes. And then you have a restaurant that's going to be more of a sit-down restaurant that's going to be 20 to 30, where you'll have a really nice meal. And that's, those are the places where I like to go. Yes. Because I don't do it that often. You know, I just... Even if oh. I've never heard of it, I look at it, I look at the menu, I'm like, okay, I'll try that. And mm -hmm. usually it's very good. Yeah. I, I mean, I like going by recommendations. You know, at the Gita I was yeah. staying at, the owner recommended this place that no, no tourist would ever find. <laughs> and it was fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And so, and so you, you mostly travel alone in France, right? Um, or you always take a friend? <laughs> You know, 50-50, sometimes I travel with friends, and I'm very lucky. Uh, my married friends, my single friends will join me, or I'll meet up with, like, my niece. So maybe for a portion of my trip, uh, I'll be with someone, and the other time, you know, I'll be on my own. And it, it really forces me. I mean, friends of mine have told me I've become a different person anyways because I'm in my happy place, which is France. <laughs> so I've become very extroverted. Uh, uh huh. So it's easier. No, yeah, I guess it's easier for me to meet people. Yeah. So it doesn't feel lonely or anything because you'll just chat with people and that's yeah. that's what you want. Exactly. You know, sitting beside someone at a cafe and you get talking. Um, I, I was at a, a restaurant in Paris and I like taking notes. I mean, I have journals from all 24 of my trips. Oh, wow. And this American, uh, I think mother, daughter, were sitting beside me and they said, Oh, are you a restaurant critic? <laughs> and I went, no, I just, um, because they heard me talking to the waiter in French and, you know, I was taking yeah. notes and all that. And I went, no, no, I'm just taking notes. Yeah, you look official. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, no, but and I love to practice my French as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So do you use websites for your recommendations or you just ask people? Ah, uh, websites, ask people. Um, Some of both, huh? Yeah. And and so your your next trip to France? Well, funny you should mention, so I was hemming and hawing, should I go in November or just wait until I, I've already booked something for January? So I changed my trip, and I'm now going for two weeks in January. I know it's probably the worst month to go, but I've been in January, and actually it was quite nice. So I'm going depends to... depends where you go. Pardon? It depends where you go. I if you go to so. Brittany in January, you won't like it, but if you go to... Provence, you might get lucky. Yeah, but my only fear is that a lot of things might be closed. But That's true. You know, I mean, right now, things could change. Uh, I'm going to do uh, four nights in London, England, and then I want to take the Eurostar to Paris because it's it's so quick and dry. And I've never done it, so it's another experience. Mm -hmm. Because it takes so, from the heart of London to the heart of Paris. That's right. So do you like do you publish all these notes that you take? Do you publish all of that in on in your website? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you know, I'm sharing with people. Uh my website, as you know, is uh France Travel Tips. But 
my tagline is, you know, quick trips to save people time and money. Yeah. So I'm trying to share with people, you know, here are the easiest ways to do this, this, and this. Yeah. So for example, I, I give them suggestions how they can get into the heart of Paris from say Charles de Gaulle airport Yeah. or um, how to save money on booking a flight. Uh, because I'd love to research. That's part of my, uh, how do you do that? I want to know. <laughs> Uh, Google searches, uh, looking at other websites. Um, I guess it's, it's just part of my personality. I love to research mm -hmm. and to save money mm -hmm. because I keep traveling to Fran France and get, yeah, it gets expensive. expensive. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you must have uh, done pretty well for yourself all your life because <laughs> I mean, if you can afford to come to France several times a year. Yeah, well, no, you know, maximum, oh, I shouldn't yeah. say some. And, you know, it's also traveling with friends, so you're sharing expenses. Right, right. You know, right. so, uh, and also the big thing is to rent an apartment. That saves me a fortune. And yeah. cooking my own meals, although I do go to restaurants. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, and I've rented cars, I've taken the train, it just all depends. How do you find driving in France? Well, I... Up until my last trip, I would say it's great. But uh, when I got home, I got two speeding tickets. And when I was in um, Cavaillon, I got a parking ticket. And yeah. I don't speed. But France has really clamped down yes. on uh, drivers. And they have, it was radar. And yes. I was only seven kilometers over the limit. Yep. I, I got one for three kilometers over the oh. limit. Yeah. And the I worst mean, thing is, because I have a French driver's license, they can tell... Because they look, uh, it's, I mean, the machine takes the, takes the, the photo of you over, but then they make sure that it's, there's a human that makes sure that this was a, you know, genuine violation, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so they look at your record too, and they could see before they send me the ticket, they could see that I had all my 12 points. So they know I'm not a speed demon, Yeah. Oh. but they still sent me a ticket for being three over the speed limit. So, you know, it's, it's just, ugh. yeah, I know. Well, how I found out was I got this charge from the car rental company. And what yeah. happens is the uh, French government or the local government has to, uh, they notify the rental company Yep. and they say, we want the records of the person who drove this car. Yep. So not only do you have to pay the fine and my fine was 45 euros mm -hmm. for speeding violation, but I also had to pay the rental company for the administrative charge for them to look up my record. Yep. So, and then the uh, parking ticket, I found, yeah, I was, should have been more careful. Yeah. And I, to pay that, I had to go to a tabac and I had to buy a 17 euro stamp yeah. to put on the card because I had no checking account. I couldn't pay the fine that way. And then you put the little 17 euro stamp on the card and you yep. mail it off. Yeah. Yep, yep, so yep. That's yep. something new I learned. Yeah, well, uh, and that's something French people know, but visitors wouldn't know that. So it's good that it, you bring it up. Yes. Um, so I put that. That was one of my posts. Yeah. No, you know, it's it's, okay. it's very good. You need to know these things, and you know it's it is a problem that everybody gets nailed for very small violations. On occasion, they catch people who really should be caught. They, that sure. So Terrible. You know, they're this dangerous. They go so fast. Yeah. But they mostly They're, catch people like you and me who just weren't paying attention for a minute. Well, exactly. So you, use your cruise control is the thing. that you know When you're in France, get a car yeah. with cruise control and use your cruise control because otherwise you'll get nailed everywhere you go. I mean, I use the cruise control even in the villages. Wow. Because I don't want to go over 50, mm -hmm. you know, because there are – off there. Sometimes there's typically inside the villages, you're not going to have the automatic things, but you're going to have the local police with their radar guns getting you. And those, well, they and, don't even have to stop you. And they have speed bumps. And they have the speed bumps too. Oh, everywhere. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, you have, you have to be very careful about your speed in France. It's the same in Italy and Spain by now. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, I was in Philadelphia. I, I drove New Jersey to Philadelphia last summer, and I got into one of those – uh, it was one of those toll roads. Mm -hmm. The GPS was telling me to get off, and at the same time I was all the way to the left, I realized that there was a toll on the right. 
And I had to choose, do I exit where I'm supposed to, or do I, you know, cross the whole freeway to get back to the toll? Yes. And I just decided to, you know, skip that toll. Mm -hmm. And of course, I, the, the car rental company, after we checked in the car, sent us the, the, the fine. So oh. it works no matter where you are, they'll find you. <laughs> exactly. So right now I'm a little gun shy about renting a car, but I know I'll get over that. Yeah. I, your idea of using the uh, cruise control, I yeah, that's a superb idea. Cruise control, and then you don't have to worry about it because my brother, for years, he said, "Ah, oh, cruise controls, that's dangerous. You shouldn't ever use that. I won't do it." And he, his latest car had it because anymore you can't even buy a car with mm -hmm. without cruise control, even in France. Mm -hmm. And he, yeah, he he lost a few points because that's the problem. In France, you pay the fine, but you also point, lose points on your driver's license. No matter and, what, how much you were over. No, you you lose more. Like my three over, I just lost one point. Wow. But you only have 12. Right. So, you know, it can, and, and for instance, if you, if you don't make a full stop at a stop sign, mm -hmm. that's four points. Wow. That happened to my sister. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> where the police, they just totally know that everybody rolls that stop. Sure. And so they just station a few guys and boom, boom, boom. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's pretty bad. Anyway, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. Driving is okay, but in a way, it's made it safer. You know, yes. it used to be pretty dangerous driving in France, and anymore, people have to drive slowly. So, mm -hmm. hey, but you you should tell. Um, France was taught, or France was talking about having a new law where you had to have a breathalyzer in your car. Is that true? That came and went. Oh, that was the last year of Sarkozy's so I can't remember what year that was but mm -hmm. when Sarkozy was the president he implemented this and everybody had to go out and buy breathalyzers the little That's disposable right. things mm -hmm. and uh, when um, Hollande came into power that's one of the first things that he got rid of Oh. and so at that point you could get fined just not for being drunk but for not having a breathalyzer <laughs> in your car <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 it's it's pretty messed up <laughs> oh gee well i'm glad i asked but if you rent a car the other thing that you have to have is the yellow jackets right the yellow safety jackets um mm. when you rent a car there will be yellow safety jackets in the yes. pockets because it's yeah mandatory. they're always special. yeah so they they have to provide those for you and typically when you rent all of these mandatory things will be there so you'll be all right on those right for the most part, I think. Yeah. Well, well, well. Okay, the last thing I want you to tell us about is that you spent New Year's Eve in Paris. Right. So a couple of years ago, my friend Laurie. So I have two friends. They're like two of my closest friends, uh, Laurie uh, and Judy. And yeah. so Laurie was with me, and we rented an apartment in Paris, and we were there for, I think, eight nights. And New Year's Eve, she picked up oysters yeah. And because I think that is a tradition, isn't it? Yes. Right. To have oysters and champagne. Right. Oysters, champagne, Christmas, a new year. Those are the meals where you'll have uh, smoked salmon, oysters, foie gras, if you're in the Southwest. Mm -hmm. Those are the, the big ones. Right. So we had oysters and steak, I think, for dinner. Yep. And then we headed out to Trocadero, which overlooks uh, the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower, yes. Unfortunately, it was spitting rain, and uh, it was extremely crowded. So we stayed a bit, and then we decided, okay, we'll go down to the Eiffel Tower. We'll forget that. It's blocked off on New Year's Eve. Yes. So we went to uh, Pont uh, Bar Hakim, which is the bridge, which is, I think, just the first bridge west of the Eiffel Tower. Oh, okay. And I w highly recommend that as the spot to watch the light show. There are no fireworks unless yeah. they change things, yeah. but there was a light show. That's and cool. so it's covered and we brought along a small bottle of champagne and glasses <laughs> and we ce celebrated New Year's Eve uh, looking at the Eiffel Tower. Oh, that's great. Champagne. But it was raining. But yeah. But and that you was still great. had thousands of people out? 
Oh, absolutely. And then forget about taking the metro back. Oh, because yeah. You can imagine it was crap. So we walked back to our apartment, which was fine because it was in the um, fifth arrondissement. So it wasn't that far. It wasn't that. Well, yeah, yeah. But, you know, when you're in Paris, you walk, walk, walk. That's right. That's one of the things that you should do, I think. If You know, yes. and if you can't, if it's really too far to walk, I would say take a, take a t- bus or a taxi so you can be seeing the city mm-hmm. rather than, I, I don't know, the metro gets on my nerves. I <laughs> and I, I hate all the stairs, especially. Yes. Off. Yeah. Yeah, you're constantly, and you never know if you're going if you're gonna get like a escalator or no escalator stairs. Mm-hmm. Is, is there gonna be a, a an elevator? And I'm very sensitive to that because I I raise guide the future guide dogs for the blind oh wow and when i have a puppy with me i Uh, have to take the escalators or the elevator mm -hmm. because they need to get used i mean if you're blind you avoid taking the stairs oh of course they can but it's easier for them to take these other things and so the dog has to get used to looking for escalators and elevators Mm-hmm. And so even in even when I'm in Paris, where I'm not going to have a dog with me in Paris, I'd still look for these things. It's just what I do. <laughs> you know, my, that's yeah. how my brain works anymore. Yeah. And and in Paris, it's like a crapshoot. You never know if you're going to get one or not, or if you're going to have to walk or if you're going to have to spend, you know, half an hour walking underground, mm-hmm. which really that just hurts. I'm like, oh, yeah. I could be walking up in the, on the surface, seeing right. Paris. Yeah. And instead, I'm down this tunnel, mm-hmm. you know, and the best I can ex- I can hope for in the tunnel is a decent musician. <laughs> you know, nothing better than that is ever going to happen in one of the subway tunnels. So, yeah, but so. I agree with you. I rarely take the metro when I'm in uh, Paris. I would rather walk and I yeah. walk for like six, seven, eight hours a day. Yeah, uh, because I just love it. Yeah. And it's really healthy for you too. So yes, exactly. So, there you go. <laughs> so what's your what's your one tip? You one the one thing that you want to tell people, or maybe the the one thing that your website that is very popular that people like to see on your website, that people go to because they find it super helpful. Well, one of the things I'm really building is my top 100 experiences, uh-huh. and on my website, I think I'm at 38. And, uh, I, you know, every week I'm trying to add a few more. It, it does take time because I'm also trying to do my, um, my weekly uh, blog posts. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I guess my whole website is geared towards the person who, maybe it's the first timer, but it also may be for the person who wants to look for something that's not mentioned in the guidebooks. Right. You know, yes, there's the Frommers, there's the top 10, and they're fabulous guides. And, you know. Oh, they're a good place to start. But- Absolutely. But these, you know, experiences like, I've done this twice, you know, taking a bike tour with Fat Tire Bike Company. Mm-hmm. I loved it so much. You, you ride through Paris, it's very safe, and then you end up on the Bateau Mouche drinking red wine. Yeah. You, yeah. you don't often read about that in tour books. No, you don't. And the thing is, because those tour books are all written so that they'll please everybody. Right. You know, they're, and I, I find them just underwhelming you know just, <laughs> just, they all recommend the same things well, exactly you go places and you will f- i mean the rick steves books bless his heart they are everywhere rick steves tourists all over yeah. the and world. then they go to all the same restaurants they all the- go to the no. same things it's like yeah, I mean, I, you know on my website i also have 10 unique experiences so one i is like sitting on a um boat i guess a barge on the Seine, drinking wine, listening to jazz. Yes. You know, that's unique. Um, yes, it's unique and it's fun. Yes. And you're not exactly. going to have a million other tourists doing the same thing at the same time. Right, right. So, you know, I'm always looking for unique things that you won't find in tour books. Well, I really appreciate that because that's one of the things I like to do, except that with the podcast, I I like to... I like to just give it the the French point of view. Like what do mm-hmm. f- you know, French people, when we tour France, what do we look at? What what is important to us as French people? Because obviously if you get all your travel advice f- from, you know, mass produced 
uh, books, mm -hmm. well, then you all end up in the same places. Right. But of course, all these places are really fun. Oh, I forgot to ask you about the kayak at the Pont du Gard. I mean, well, it's I, funny. I, I have to add that because I that's, know. that's well, one of the cool ones. We're on the same wave, wavelength because I was going to bring that up. You know, yes. I was listening, I listen to all your podcasts and they, my compliments to you in the least. They are Thank you. not only informative, but just fun to listen to. So I was listening to your one about Pont de Gard. Yep. And I've done this twice. Uh, once again, my two best friends, Lori and uh, Judy. Yeah. And uh, we went kayaking. We picked up the um, kayak in uh, Colias. I yes. think I'm saying that right. Yeah, cool. Yes, yes. And um, you basically paddle down the River Gordon. Yep. I know you had mentioned, you know, it's eight kilometers and it's a long way, but it it wasn't tiring. Like, I don't really think... No. It's not strenuous. And I think the website says that it will only take you two hours, but most people take a very long time. They have a picnic because yeah. they provide you with this... I, I don't know how to just, it looks like a, a wine barrel mm -hmm. that's plastic. Yes. It's a store, your lunch, your clothes. I see. You know, in it, um, in case you tip over. Yes. <laughs> but you won't. Your camera, but, your, yeah. But it's wonderful. So what you do is you park your car in Coleas, you yeah. kayak down to um, uh, the Pont de Gare. You actually paddle under the Pont de Gare. Yeah. And it's just, it's so much fun. Yeah. What, what time of the year did you do it? Uh, July and August. Okay. So, so the water was probably not very high. No, no, yeah. it wasn't. Right. Uh, and, and that's one of the things. Sometimes the water gets low enough that the kayaks kind of get stuck a little bit, especially if the riders yes. are a little heavy. And so, <laughs> and so they have, they spend more, they exert more, uh, strength just trying to get out of the, <laughs> Actually, that's true. Now that you bring that up, yeah, I recall that we kind of, oh, we've hit some rocks. It was yes. a sign. Yes. So it's not dangerous at all. You're going to be within, you know, inches of the bottom, especially <laughs> in July and August. The rest of the year, there's more water. But July and August, it's dry. It's not that much right. going down. One thing I should mention about the Pont de Gare, I went there uh, in 1978 with my family. Mm. And at that time you could walk on top on the very top, on the very top and through it, you cannot walk on top no. anymore. And I can understand people. What you can do now is you can, in the summer, you can pay, I think it's five or six euros and hoof it to the top. And they have, you know how the Pont du Gard, the, the, the actual canal, the, the, the viaduct part. Yeah. yeah the viaduct part where the water used to run. It, it was covered, but they've uncovered a few of the areas. And so you can walk inside of the duct. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and that way it's safe, but nobody gets to walk on top. Yeah. I can't believe I have pictures of me standing there with I like know. no railing. And I, <laughs> my mother talked to me, talk to me about doing that when she was on her honeymoon with my father. So this was what, probably the fifties, early fifties, probably. Mm -hmm. And she was petrified and they had to have, uh, my father and, and another man had to carry her down. Can you imagine <gasps> carrying somebody down that narrow thing? <laughs> they were crazy. I mean, it's narrow. It's like a meter 20 or something Yeah, right? that narrow, but yeah. you're way high. And if you run into anybody who's afraid of heights, like my mother, well, yeah. it could get bad very quickly. <laughs> and so. it's like, you know, it's very high. It's a beautiful, yeah. I think, like it's an iconic structure. I yeah. think they say it's one of the most photographed pictures uh, when you're thinking of France or Provence. Yeah. And it's beautiful. Yeah. I think it's beautiful. Yeah. And it's a fun, you know, it's, you did it the fun way. You get on the kayak. It's not exerting really. I mean, it's not like you're going to be doing anything. No, it's not strenuous different. at all. It's not strenuous, but it's fun. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, you see it from a different perspective, a different angle. And you, I, I think that adds a lot to the, to the adventure. Absolutely. It's not just going to see a monument and then leaving. Right. Right. You have to you have to spend a little time there, getting a feel for it, 
Mm-hmm. And also, if you have planned in advance enough, then you you have read about it. You you know, or you've listened a pod, to the podcast about it. You you know, you know more about it than your average bear, and so necessarily you'll get more out of it. Absolutely, Just right. You put in the time to 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 know a little bit about it. Mm-hmm. You know, so my website. You know, I mentioned I talk a lot about you know kayaking uh, under the Pont de Gare, and you know, it's it's finding these experiences that. Like everybody goes to the Arc de Triomphe or the um, Notre Dame, right, mm-hmm. to see the Eiffel Tower. Well, I went to the Institut uh, du Monde Arabe. Yes. And it's free. You can go to the top. You just have to go through a, uh, uh, they screen, you know, to make sure you're, you don't have anything dangerous. Yes. Both the elevators go to the top terrace and you get a superb view and it's free. Oh, I didn't realize that the terrace was free there. Yes. Oh. So it's great. And it's a great view. You can see the Seine. You can see uh, Notre Dame. Because it's not free to go through the Institut du Monde Arabe, is it? I is the don't. museum free? Probably not. No, I don't think the museum's free. But, but going getting to the free. terraces. Oh, wow. That's a great tip. Yeah. So, you know, it's looking for these unique things. Yeah. Yeah. And also you, you, you have such a love for the country that uh, it, it comes through in your, in your website. So <laughs> oh, thank you. So that's wonderful. Okay. Well, tell us your website address one more time. Uh, it's, so it's France travel tips.com. There you go. And yes. people can write to you there. I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so very much. We have been talking for like an hour and 10 minutes or something. I, you know, I was, after we did the pre podcast, um, yeah, yeah. I was so energized. <laughs> I was telling my friend Judy that I just, talking about France, just, I come alive. I love it so much. So I you can't sure thank do. you enough. Oh, you are so welcome. It's very fun. Well, and for other people, it's fun because they get to hear your excitement and get, <laughs> You hear your tips and all that. So, yes, wonderful. Thanks. All right, Janice, thank you very much. Thank you very much too. And bonne journée. Merci à toi aussi. Et, et très très bon, uh, bonnes vacances en, en France. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Uh, au revoir. This brings us to the end of another Join Us in France travel podcast. You can leave a comment on the website, follow us on Facebook, or look for at Paris Podcast on Twitter. I put lots of information on Facebook and Twitter that never makes it into the shows. And also, this is a subliminal message. Join the mailing list now, today. You can do that on joinusinfriends.com. Look for the green button. Et c'est tout pour aujourd'hui.